Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. He followed two paths. One led to moments of boxing greatness and worldwide respect. The other led to prison, public disgrace, and a psychological maze from which he may never escape. Yet, as we'll see over the next hour, Mike Tyson fights on, doggedly searching for the light of redemption, while haunted by the dark alleys of a past no child ever deserved. Thing. Cat's still scared to get in the ring. Mike Tyson comes from a place that you and I would prefer not to even visit. It was a bad neighborhood. It was a survival of the fittest, the basest of instinct. Growing up as a, you know, a kid who hung around girls a lot when he was a kid, little girls, and he developed a lisp and began kind of talking like a gal. And how he got abused by boys, beat up, and he never fought back. He was a kid who collected pigeons. Uh, he had a, a kid, took one of his pigeons and just ripped the head off the pigeon. And to see that happen to one of his babies, finally it turned in Mike. And it's the first time he ever fought back. And he, he, beat, the, he beat the hell out of the kid. And he found out when he hit people, they stayed hit. And they fell asleep for minutes on end. And he suddenly said, I'm not going to take this stuff anymore. I'm just going to fight back. And that's when Mike turned from the victim to the executioner. This man was a killer. He was there. He came in without a robe. He came in without trappings. He came in to destroy you, and you knew it. He was flattening everybody. And here's this guy walking around with these black trunks and black shoes, and looking like, you know, something who had emerged out of the primordial ooze. And Ratliff will sit it out. I want to fight, 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 and destruct the world, because I'm the best fighter in the world. When Mike Tyson stood in his corner and the bell rang, and he banged his gloves together and all you could see were his eyes and they were ferocious and he ran across the ring. There was an adrenaline rush that you had that was just astonishing. He was dynamic, savage, ferocious. Mike Tyson wanted to kill people. Kid Dynamite. He hits you like a stick of dynamite and your head blows off. He was a guy without pity. He did not give a about the guy he was fighting. Nothing. I didn't challenge me with their somewhat prim primitive skills. They're just as good as dead. I watched him in Atlantic City against Michael Spinks. And he came out that night, and Michael Spinks looked across the ring and didn't want to fight. This was a man who was going to break Rocky Marciano's 49 straight wins. This was a man who was the baddest man on the planet. His words, an extension of John L. Sullivan's, I can lick any son of a bitch in the house. Come one, come all, because nobody can get close to me. They're not even close. I'm the best fighter in the world. For his first 37 fights, Tyson was perfect. But out of the ring, his life was a shambles, in part due to a borderline personality disorder that would not be accurately diagnosed until late in his career. There's just this up and down cycle because while he was on medication for years, he couldn't fight on it. So for him to, uh, for him to be able to fight effectively, he had to go off the medication. People who go on and off their antidepressant medications typically are not well managed. Their moods go up and down with their medications. Their anger management goes up and down as their medications fluctuate. Now, for Mike Tyson as a boxer, if he's going to fight, he needs to go on and off his medications depending on his fights. That is a very tricky thing for Mr. Tyson and those who are trying to help him. If he remains on those drugs, 
Uh, he can't be aggressive because they take away his aggression. And so, you know, it's, uh, wow. <laughs> it's just combustible. Tyson's emotional instability was demonstrated before the world at the MGM Grand in June of 1997. He bites Evander Holyfield and the commission insists that he get a psychiatric evaluation before they can go further. And they come back with a diagnosis basically that anger management has to be dealt with. Now what is anger management? He suffers from rage attacks. What are rage attacks? They are uncontrolled responses to even minor provocations in which there's anger and aggression, hitting out, striking out. They can be dangerous and they're not well controlled. He's a ticking time, he's a ticking time on right now. He hasn't straightened anything out. He, if anything, he's getting more confused. Oh, anybody in here can f with this. Man, this is the ultimate, man. F you, you hoe. Come and stay in my face, I'm you ass for that. Everybody, you bitch. Come on, you bitch. You're scared, coward. You got man enough to f with me. You can't last two minutes in my world, bitch. Look at you scared now, you hoe. Scared like a little white bitch. Scared of the real man. I'll f you till you love me, faggot. In order to get his anger management under good control, he has to compromise himself as a boxer. In order to be the best prize fighter he can, he has to stop his medications. So no matter what happens, I think he has a difficult road to hoe. The youngest of Lorna Tyson's three children, Mike came into the world on June 30th, 1966, in Brooklyn, New York. Things started going wrong for Mike when he was born, when he was born in the blood hole belly of Brownsville and didn't know his father. His dad left when his mother was pregnant with Mike, and um, his mother was just kind of outmatched, I think, by the world. She believed in God, and Michael saw a world where there couldn't be a God. With no one to supervise him, Tyson began striking back when other kids his age were watching cartoons. His M.O. was to stand outside of a supermarket to fool the old ladies that I was a nice kid and I would carry their food back to the projects. May I please help you with your packages to go? And he'd help them and then he'd freaking knock their teeth out, 60-year-old women, when the elevator door closed. He and another little kid steal some pigeons from a guy, and they catch Tyson and the other kid, and they're up on a roof of a tenement, and they tie a rope around the kid's neck and throw him over the edge to kill him. Mike had dropped out of school in the fourth grade to start running with his gang, the Jolly Stompers. They'd beat people up, and then they'd rub, they'd rub their, um, their fingers in the snow to get their rings off them. It was pretty strong stuff. He lived on the streets. He went into Spofford House, a juvenile detention facility when he's 11. He goes into the reformatory when he's 12 on an 18-month sentence. God knows what went on in those places. Heaven help us. Uh, but then he ended up in Tryon, the boys' place upstate. And there uh, he was discovered by a guy named Stewart, a guard. Um, I think the first time he saw Mike, he was uh, chained to a radiator. Probably one of the most insecure kids I ever saw at that age. Scared to death of everything. In an effort to instill discipline and confidence in Tyson, Bobby Stewart, a counselor at Tryon and a former fighter, began to spar with him daily. He hit me the hardest left, straight left hand that I've ever been hit with. I went straight home to my wife after with a broken nose and saying, I can't fool this kid no more. Stewart calls Custy Amato and says, hey, I got somebody here you're not gonna believe. He said, I have this young kid named Mike Tyson who wants to box, and I'd like to bring him down for you and Teddy to take a look at. If anyone could handle Tyson, it was Constantine Customato. He had already turned two street-hardened talents into world champions, Floyd Patterson and Jose Torres. 
But for all his legendary teaching skills, D'Amato was living in boxing exile. Brought up the tough part of Manhattan. He fought a one-man battle against the mob, not fighting the fighters they wanted him to fight. But he was a strange, strange man. There was only one Cus D'Amato. I mean, he was, in my opinion, he was the smartest man that boxing ever produced. I think a light bulb went off. Cus says, I have found my Sonny Liston. I'm going to do everything to coddle him, to protect him, to develop him, because he is my revenge on the world. Mike was going to be Cus's legacy, Cus's um, epitaph, uh, Cus's vindication after all the years that he had been out in the Siberia of boxing, out of boxing, basically. He had that innate Dempsey-like aggression. He wanted to maim you with every punch. The speed was breathtaking, and you can see that this kid could become another Dempsey, another Marciano, physically, that it was all there as a teenager. That style, with the hands here and the bobbing and weaving, was really old school. But it worked for Mike Tyson because that created enormous leverage, which gave him the, the additional power that made him into the ultimate killing machine. On his 14th birthday, Tyson was paroled and placed in the custody of D'Amato, who owned a gym in rural Catskill, New York. D'Amato's reclamation project began immediately. Cus was like a father, Mike. He had to build up his character and his confidence to motivate Mike and to show Mike that he could, he could become somebody. This old white philosopher would come up into his room middle of the night, and it was almost like a dream that would come to Tyson uh, to hear this old man whispering in his ear, remember what I told you today, remember what I showed you, and just driving these lessons home. I mean, they would sit at night and watch these old black and white films of the old great boxers, and they became Mike's guys as a teenager. Everything that Customato did was about Mike and was about making Mike the youngest heavyweight champion ever. That was Cus's holy grail. Tyson and Customato, the, the kid and the old guy, it was, it was like a Hollywood movie. And we were all prepared to buy into the fairy tale. I don't think any of us saw how damaged he was emotionally and psychologically. Behind the Boys Town image presented to the media, D'Amato was indulging his charge in a disturbing pattern of permissiveness. Tyson had been thrown out of school, suspended already for getting confrontation with teachers, uh, getting physical with teachers, getting uh, physical with other people. Teddy Atlas, when I throw Mike out of the gym, send him home, you know, just punish him. But Cus would make excuses for Mike and say, no, he's special. So there was problems and rifts between me, Cus, and Tyson in our philosophies of the disciplining of Mike Tyson, what was right and what was wrong. On his way to an amateur record of 24 and 3, Tyson continued to test the limits of acceptable human behavior outside the ring. The 16-year-old crossed the line in the fall of 1982. I came home, and my wife was in the kitchen with her sisters, and they were crying. Tyson had grabbed an 11-year-old sister and uh, had tried to force himself on her. I had to get a hold of him. Um, I went to the gym, and all of a sudden, a cab pulled up. Tyson was getting out of it, and I pushed him and caught him a piece of And then um, I put the gun to his head. It was a 38. I made sure it was loaded. I pulled the trigger back. I said, you ever touch my family again, I'll kill you. Upon learning of the incident, D'Amato cut off all ties with Atlas. In March of 1985, Tyson turned pro at 18 and began to wreak havoc on the heavyweight division. That was a right to the bottom.
body and an uppercut to the head, and Furbick is down. On November 22nd, 1986, Mike Tyson dispatched WBC champion Trevor Burbick in the second round to become, at 20, the youngest heavyweight champion in history. It's over. That's all. And we have a new era in boxing. But a year earlier, he had lost his emotional compass. D'Amato had succumbed to pneumonia. You can't underestimate what that did to Tyson's life. There was no one to keep any kind of hold or shape or form to his life. He won the heavyweight championship and he took a bottle of champagne and poured it on Cus's grave. Tyson lapsed into a lightless world he knew all too well. He uh, went back to Brooklyn and, and participated with this guy in a mugging in an elevator in the housing project there, just for kicks. It was just back to the streets of Brownsville to get that feeling back inside of him that he had as a kid. Despite a sporadic pattern of social misbehavior that included sexual advances and violent confrontations, Tyson successfully defended his title six times under co-managers Jimmy Jacobs and Bill Caton. Bill was the contract man. Jimmy was the guy that had the warm, personal relationship with Mike. Really the only thing that, that's keeping that car on the road is Jimmy Jacobs at that point. If Tyson's hold on his mainstream public image was becoming increasingly tenuous, his ring fury resonated on the streets of urban America. Hard, refuse to lose. Black shorts, black shoes, the body abused with shots to the body, get the ribs bruised. The wrong cats all confused when they lose. What a shot. The black community sees Tyson very, very different. And particularly, I think, uh, with young black people and the whole, what you might call, hip hop generation, have embraced Tyson because he stands for the anti-establishment. Tyson was adopting this hip hop image and surrounding himself with rap artists. Uh, there was just this aura that uh, it was set up to be a good versus evil thing, and, and Tyson bought into this. Hip-hop was about angry black guys. Lyrics of fury, this total confrontational, aggressive, assertive stuff. Mike took all of those metaphors and made them real. When Mike Tyson came out on Welcome to the Terror Dome, and you're coming into my house, and I will skillfully and tactfully tear you down, because when I walk into the arena, it's on. But real life proved less simple. Six weeks after Tyson married actress Robin Givens in February of 1988, Jacobs died of leukemia at 58. Over the next three months, the champ's relationship with Caton dissolved while his life at home grew stormy. That June, the champ unloaded his frustrations in Atlantic City's convention hall. And he's down again and in serious trouble. He's not going to make it. It's all over. After he knocked out Michael Spinks in 91 seconds, uh, that was as good as he got. That was the last night that Kevin Rooney was his trainer. Rooney used to kiss him goodbye. That was the last kiss goodbye. And there's this huge void in Tyson's life. When Jacobs died, OK, you've got Don King swooping in like a vulture to take over. And from that point on, what little semblance of order was in his life it was over. Kevin Rooney was out, Caton was out, and then uh, his wife and mother-in-law kind of moved in, and this sorry soap opera began. Robin changed things. In fact, uh, almost as soon as they was married, she called to say, I'm uh, Mrs. Mike Tyson and I'm taking over. She actually had the nerve to say that. With Caton and Rooney gone, and Tyson's domestic beatings played out in headlines, he spun out of control. The Mike Tyson story started on Sunday when his car hit a tree near his upstate New York training camp. Tyson was knocked unconscious for almost a half hour. Mike goes around crying out for help. And the way that he does it, driving cars into trees, you know, beating up people. Even things as, as hideous as rapes and assaults 
are almost Mike Tyson's way of declaring emotional bankruptcy. I can't deal with life. I can't take care of myself. You know, here, take care of me. Take me somewhere. During an interview with Barbara Walters in September of 1988, Tyson sat quietly while his wife provided to millions a window into their private life. Michael is a manic depressive. He is. I mean, that's just a fact. He's got a side to him that's scary. Michael is intimidating, to say the least. He shakes, he pushes, he, um, he swings. And see, there was something horrific about him being sedated on that television show and her sitting there talking about him like he was some trained bear. The uh, interview sent him into that rage when Mike was tossing furniture around and where the police had to be called to their home in New Jersey and Ruth and Robin had to run for their, their own safety. A week later, Gibbons filed for divorce. I won't talk nice to you and talk about fornicating with you and letting you suck my dick because if I was eloquent with you, you would still look at me as a scumbag. It won't work. You have your perception of me. There's no question in my mind that this is an enormously emotionally disturbed personality who has not gotten the love, the therapy, or the medicines that he needs. People with anger management problems, like Mr. Tyson, would do well to have good mental health folks on the team to help you judge what medications you need, to help you with your therapy. It's very hard for a person with anger and rage attacks to contain them by himself. There's nobody that I've seen in his life who has ever cared about his interests first. Everybody's wanted a piece of the golden calf. And he's been the golden calf. You have friends that you can talk to. I don't have one friend in my entire life. My experience, um, my experience in life produced the person that I am. And the person that I am, um, I was never successful with friends. He's been hurt. He's been burnt by most people he trusted. He was crazy about Robin Givens. He got screwed over by it. And being Mike Tyson, who do you trust? Cut loose in an alien world, Tyson began to lose the one discipline that he had mastered. He has stopped being the scientific fighter that Custy Amato raised and that Kevin Rooney honed and Teddy Atlas honed. He has become a headhunter. And that set him up for Buster Douglas. Tyson's 10th title defense would take place in Tokyo on February 10th, 1990. Tyson goes over with his entourage. They're having a wonderful time. They're drinking and cavorting and everything else. He wasn't training like he, like he should have been training. He probably had a, a serious false sense of uh, security that he was uh, unbeatable. If Tyson believed he could not be beaten, he wasn't alone. The odds of Buster Douglas winning were 42 to 1. And you got to remember, this is a time when everybody in the world, everybody, thought Mike Tyson was the toughest guy on the planet, indestructible, could not lose. All right, it's round one, the heavyweight championship of the world from Tokyo. What Buster Douglas did that night was beautiful. He would wait till Mike would plant his feet. Pop him twice with the left jab, move back out of range, and throw the right. Same scenario, over and over. When an intimidator fails to intimidate, he becomes intimidated. Douglas is gonna get on him, he nails Mike again! Tyson getting hit like we've never seen it before! When Mike got into uh, trouble in the ring, he had guys that had no boxing background, really, like uh, Jay Bright working his corner. Uh, there was nobody there to give him uh, good advice or good counsel, like a, uh, a, a Customato or a Kevin Rooney or a Teddy Atlas, and then he was lost. They're trying to treat Tyson's swollen eyes with what appeared to be a prophylactic filled with ice. That is not ice, that's tap water. 
Uh, it was pathetic, just total incompetence. In the eighth round, Tyson caught Douglas with his best punch. And maybe, oh, a right uppercut puts the challenger down. The most interesting psychological dynamic of the fight happened at that very moment, because James knew he had taken Mike Tyson's best shot, and he was still awake. I don't know if he can do it. He's back up on his feet. The ninth round begins almost as the eighth round in Mike's mind's eye had ended. This was his chance. The ninth round was one of the great rounds of heavyweight boxing of all time, of all time. Mike Tyson came out with the intent of ending it. James knew what was coming. Douglas is gonna get on him, he nails Mike again! Surprising after Douglas went down in the eighth round to see him come back and nail Tyson like this. I was in the zone, man. I was in that zone, that zone. Immediately, because it was, was just my time to shine. The uh, bell ended the round and saved it, and somehow, rather, in a minute, the corner. Oh, Tyson nailed! Oh, Tyson! What a shock! Can make it up! The count is up to three! And four! And five! Tyson! We never expect you to see this! Does he know where he is? We got a new heavyweight champion! We have a new heavyweight champion! It's all over! It's all over. Maybe the most poignant shot I've ever seen of a fighter on the canvas. Mike groping for the mouthpiece, groping in a sense for the, the lost identity of Mike Tyson. Tyson lost not only his title, but a part of himself that he could never regain. He had lost that thing which frightened everybody the most when they got in the ring with him. His aura of invincibility, he was no longer invincible. Once Tyson's invincibility was shattered, it's like Humpty Dumpty. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put him back together again. Buster Douglas probably began the long, slow slide to tragedy. Because once Tyson could be beaten, then in a sort of symbolic way, then it really was open season on Mike Tyson. You could see that Mike was headed for a brick wall in his life. It was just to be a matter of when he was going to hit it, not if he was going to hit it. And he hit it in Indianapolis and hard. I'm in a dream day after day. Mm. Beautiful women such an array. What can I say? Here you have a guy who probably never thought of himself as an attractive guy, right? Then he becomes a heavyweight champion of the world, and all of these women are available to him. He did have a appreciation for the female form. I can remember going to see him. He asked me, was I going to any clubs and did I know any girls? I said, yeah, Mike, I know a couple, but I want to try to keep them away from you um, if I possibly can. I said, why, do you, why are you so rough? We're talking to women in Hollywood parties. And so, I mean, here's some of the things you say to these movie stars. It's awesome. You wouldn't say that to your mother. You wouldn't say that to a bad girlfriend. He said, a doctor, come to see me just because who I am. They think I'm an animal, some kind of gorilla. They don't want to know me. They just want to know the savage guy. Well, they want to know a savage guy. I'm going to give them a savage guy. And women were turned on by the raw power. And in fact, the same things that made some people scared of him also made him, you know, very attractive. I uh, swiftly turned around and I noticed his hand going back to his body, you know, away from my behind. And I said, try that again and I'll smack the blank out of you. Since 1988, Mike Tyson has had more than a dozen brushes with the law, including several involving sexual assault. In July of 1991, he was arrested and charged with the rape of 18-year-old Desiree Washington, a contestant in the Miss Black America beauty pageant. You know, basically, I'm innocent. I do nothing. Uh, um, Desiree Washington knows what happened. I know what happened, and we're going to prove that I'm innocent. I can't say I was shocked. It was no secret to anybody inside boxing. Tyson was roaming the sexual landscape in a very free way. Mike Tyson, he was a child prodigy run amok. And as often happens with child prodigies, there's nobody there to say no. And when somebody says no, it doesn't register. 
He liked to hurt women during sex. His wires were crossed in his mind between violence and eroticism. And he couldn't keep the two straight. If a woman goes with you and goes into your room and goes into your bed at two o'clock in the morning, and then she accuses him of rape, I think that Tyson didn't believe it. Regardless of the ulterior motives or the, the, the situations premeditating that that brought her to his hotel room, no means no. Rape is rape. Mike's track record and Mike's history and Mike's persona is not one to give you confidence that her no was respected. The only two people know what happened in that room are Mike Tyson and Desiree Washington. So hard evidence, I don't think there was a lot of hard evidence. Get off me, get off me, please. Get off me. And, and she was like, don't fight me, don't fight me. And the person was a lot stronger than I was, and he just did what he wanted. And I was saying, stop, please, stop. And he just didn't stop. I was at the rape trial. I covered it for 14 days. And all I had to do was listen to Desiree Lynn Washington say how the rape had occurred. And I believed her. Anybody that listened to her believed her. It was hard not to, how graphic she was. The juxtaposition of this massive man and this little bitty, very young girl really had an impact. And I thought that impact carried right through her testimony. Once she testified, you could tell when you watched the jury that, in my opinion, they believed what she said. And that was it. Mike Tyson is a complex injured, traumatic human being. He was shown as an animal, and the tactic was to present him as an animal. Suddenly there he was on the witness stand, buck naked and incapable of defending himself. And the uh, prosecutor, Garrison, beat him to a pulp. Mike Tyson testified, quote, I was having oral sex with her. She asked for intercourse. She never told me to stop. She never said that it hurt. She never said no. Mike Tyson was a babbling idiot. And that's not to say that he doesn't have the smarts to be able to do it. He's just a guy who doesn't know how to speak in public. He can't take care of himself. He's always on the defensive. He can't handle those kinds of things with his social skills. If Tyson had sat there and never said a word, looked remorseful, taken a few notes, maybe he would have scraped out of it. At 10.25, we were notified that they had reached a verdict, and within the last two minutes, they have announced their verdict. Guilty on all three counts. Based on facts, it was maybe the most poorly defended case I had ever seen. He had a tax attorney represent him in a rape case. Vince Fuller was picked to represent Mike Tyson at trial because he had done a great job for Don King. But this case just wasn't suited for his personality, unfortunately. But I have to tell you, Moses, Jesus, Mohammed, Clarence Darrow, and Thurgood Marshall together could not have won this case because there were two prosecutors in the case. One of them was wearing a robe. I know there were a lot of people that were very anti-Tyson and wanted to see him basically sent to the gallows. But I think a lot of people thought he got railroaded. On March 26, 1992, Judge Patricia Gifford sentenced Tyson to serve six years at the Indiana Youth Center. He wrote me a letter, inexplicably. And one of the paragraphs of this letter said, Mr. Gray, I will never admit to raping this woman, even if it lessens my time because I just didn't do it and I'm not going to say I did. However, there have been five to seven other things throughout the course of my life that I have done which are far worse than that of which I've been accused. So I feel I'm in the right place. After serving just over three years, Mike Tyson was released from prison on March 25th, 1995. Outwardly, at least, he appeared to be a changed man. We have an image of Mike Tyson, and he's reinvented himself. He came out of prison with a male tattoo and, and spouting, you know, Eastern mysticism, and suddenly he's a quasi-educated Mike Tyson. 
He was in with the Muslim philosophy, uh, and the Muslims in this flying wedge were the ones escorting him and taking him out of prison. And there was a power struggle there about where Don wanted Mike to go, as opposed to where the Muslims were, were going to take him. And uh, a very determined Don King said, uh, this boy ain't going to Mecca. This boy's going to Cleveland, where Don lives. <laughs> Don King said, give him anything he wants, just keep him fighting. Five wristwatches, give it to him. What do you want? Two uh, Rolls Royces, buy it for him. He had a surfeit uh, of wealth, and, and, and nothing meant anything to him. And he had a great deal of self-loathing. With homes in four states, a fleet of pricey cars, and a menagerie of rare wild animals, Tyson lived extravagantly inside his public bubble. He had this, uh, this fierce loyalty to King that was uh, beyond just the contractual. He was a con and Don was a con, that they had both done hard time in prison, that, uh, that Don had even taken it a step further and, and, and killed men, you know? I think Mike liked that. Now this was all about making money, making money quickly, and Don King, who was a genius at that, uh, engineered this string of comeback fights. And it was the most cynical campaign I think I've ever seen, even for boxing. Under King's Midas touch, Tyson earned huge paydays as he won three straight fights, the last against WBC champion Frank Bruno in March of 1996. Then, two months after knocking out Bruce Seldon that September for the WBA title, Tyson faced the number one contender, Evander Holyfield. I realized that Mike was going to hit me, and, but I knew I could take his punches. The only thing that Mike hadn't shown since he came back, he hadn't been hit. He backed Tyson up. He could push him around. Uh, uh, he could take his shots. He was the only man in the ring that night, and he beat him senseless. During their rematch in June of 1997, Tyson sought redemption. Instead, he found shame and disgrace. For the first time, Two rounds, he'd gotten the bejabbers beaten out of him. He came out, he wasn't aggressive at all. And I was able to get to him. He just figured, I can't win. There is no way I can win. Let me out of this. I saw Holyfield jump up and go like that and jump around and said, he bit me, he bit me. My first thought was that, you know, I need to bite him back because I knew what type of person he was. And then they got him back to the center of the ring and uh, told him, you know, let's get to it. And they got to it again, and he bit him again. I <laughs> that was it. When he could stare at guys, boom, gone. But when he hit them and they didn't fall, when he stared at them and they stared back, and he couldn't overpower a person in those ways, he came up empty. He has to go and rely on character. He didn't have any. Eleven days later, the Nevada Athletic Commission unanimously voted to revoke Tyson's boxing license and fine him $3 million. With his earning power seriously diminished, the ex-champ, who had married Monica Turner in April, demanded from King an accounting of his finances. As much money as those guys have made with him, they screwed him, you know? He got so many Judases around him, it's, it's like he don't know who to believe, man, you know? I'm just trying to get out this debt, man. You know what I mean? The Don King got me involved with, but I'm just trying to get out this debt, man. Just so many things were going on you know, with Mike's money, uh, but without Mike's knowledge. He realizes King stole from him, but it was a mistake Mike Tyson made twice. He went with Don King in 1988, and then when he came out of prison, he went back to King. And I think those two choices are Tyson's responsibility. In 1998, Tyson sued Don King for $100 million, claiming the fight promoter had cheated him. Six years later, the two antagonists settled for $14 million, all of which would be applied toward Tyson's $38 million debt. It's all been Mike. It's all been Mike. Everybody's made bad decisions, but Mike is a recidivist. He is a repeat offender. He doesn't stop. Mike Tyson is not fighting for his place in history. There was a time when Mike Tyson did fight for his place in history, and it seemed assured. Now he's fighting because A, he needs money. B, there's nothing else he can do. 
In October of 1998, the results of a psychiatric examination contended that Tyson was not manic depressive, but instead suffered from low self-esteem and bouts of depression. Days later in Nevada, Tyson's boxing license was reinstated, despite a recent run-in with the law on the East Coast. According to Maryland police, Tyson punched one man in the face and kicked another in the groin following a minor traffic accident Monday. Tyson pleaded no contest to a misdemeanor assault for punching two motorists. He would serve three and a half months in prison and was released on March 24, 1999. I hate to be so hard on a person who came from an impoverished and terribly hard background, but what athlete has ever had a more opportunity to redeem himself than Mike Tyson has? How many times does one individual have to be asked, are you sorry for what you did? He never shows the slightest remorse at anything he's done. I know this sounds terribly harsh, but he is near to worthless as a human being can be. In 1999, Tyson continued to create mayhem, not only outside the ring, but also in it. Trying to break the guy's arm in a clinch, knocking the referee down over in Scotland. You know, there's sort of like a trail of evidence there that suggests that if there were lessons to be learned, that he didn't learn them. On January 22, 2002, four days after his wife Monica filed for divorce and custody of their two children, Mike Tyson charged Lennox Lewis during a promotion for their scheduled bout in Las Vegas on April 6. Seven days later, Tyson was denied a license to box by the Nevada Athletic Commission for a second time. His future as a boxer was uncertain. I came into this room today with an open mind, with the burden of proof being on you to prove yourself. Boxing will be fine when Mike Tyson leaves boxing. The question is, will Mike Tyson be fine when boxing leaves him? After securing a boxing license in Tennessee, Tyson hit a six foot five inch wall when he met Lennox Lewis in Memphis on June 8th, 2002. From the opening bell, it became increasingly clear the man once known as Iron Mike was history. It takes some courage for Mike to get up from that shot. Seven, eight, nine. He's up. Lennox Lewis knocks out Mike Tyson and finishes him. I was heartbroken to see him there with his eyes swollen up and his blood and the referee counting. And it almost looked as if he knew that this is what people wanted of him finally that it can't end until people get this, that the bad guy is, you know, killed. And when he doesn't have the structure of, of boxing anymore, you just wonder what's gonna happen to him. I hope he just um, recedes into his little world and, and finds some happiness. Where do you go from here, Mike? I don't know, man. I might just fade into Bolivian, you know what I mean? Um, I don't have nowhere to go and nothing to do, you know what I mean? I just go find my pigeons on the roof in New York. People forget he was a beloved figure as a young champion. He was a bigger sports star in this country than Michael Jordan. He was bigger than Bo Jackson. He was the king of the hill, 1988, 1989. And he destroyed that all. But at the same time, he's got nobody to blame, really, other than himself. In July of 2004, Tyson was a nine to one favorite to beat Englishman Danny Williams. By the fourth round, it was clear that only the odds favored the former champ. His comeback fight ended when he was knocked out. At 38, his potential for greatness was an old memory. Mike Tyson, I don't know if he has a death wish, but I don't think he thinks about mortality. It's coming, he'll accept it. I don't think the story ends well. He's so susceptible to being led astray at, at, at every turn. I don't think it ends pretty. I don't think he can navigate what's left of his youth and get out alive. Mike Tyson at 20 appeared to be a hard polished gem that had been mined from the dark shafts of poverty and despair. For a while he dazzled us. Then, all too soon, his tragic flaws came under public scrutiny and we all watched his life turn and twist ever downward into a nightmare of distorted reality. For Sports Central,